Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's talk. We will get started momentarily after we give another minute or so for people to log on. We thank you very much for joining us. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of Mike Zoni, director of Harvard's Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, welcome to this semester's uh, second session of Critical Issues for Contemporary China. I'm Bill Overholt, a senior research fellow at the Kennedy School and a member of the organizing committee for this series. <clears throat> Our speaker today is William Reinch, who will speak to us about China as best customer and biggest threat, trade policy in the Biden era. Bill Reinch holds the Scholl Chair in International Business at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Previously, he served for 15 years as president of the National Foreign Trade Council, uh, where he led efforts in favor of open markets. He con concurrently served as a member of the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. <laughs> Bill also served as undersecretary of commerce for export administration during the Clinton administration. Prior to that, he spent 20 years on Capitol Hill where he worked sequentially for one Democrat and one Republican in the Senate and one Democrat and one Republican in the House. Bill, I'm afraid that even acknowledging that we can remember a time when that was possible labels us as old codgers from a previous era. Uh, what our audience should know, though, is that Bill Reinch's experience gives him mastery of the trade issues, awareness of who is doing what to whom, and a determination to communicate objectively. Uh, with that, over to you, Bill. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Let me say first, it's it's a real honor to appear with you. Um, I followed your writings for a very long time, and uh, I've always considered uh, Bill Overholt to be one of the great uh, commentators and analysts of what's going on in China. And the best accolade I can give him is that he's usually right. Uh, and there are plenty of people that are usually not right. So. Uh, to the audience, I encourage you, read what, read what he puts out and listen to him, because he usually gets it right. Uh, let me also say it, it's, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be uh, here virtually uh, at Harvard. Uh, I have to say, when I was in high school looking at colleges, one of my ambitions was to apply to Harvard and be accepted and then turn them down. I thought that would be infinitely cool. Uh, but in the end, I was too cheap to uh, pay, the, uh, pay the application fee knowing that the outcome was that I wasn't gonna go there either way. Uh, but it's nice to be connected uh, in some way with Harvard even you know, many, many years later. Um, I'm gonna talk about China and uh, uh, put in a couple stories, but personal experience, but also try to end up with the landscape of I think where we are now uh, and uh, with uh, where I think we ought to go, uh, but with a little history along the way and a few slides, which we don't need to put up at the moment, but uh, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, the China, US-China relationship, I think right now is our most challenging bilateral relationship. There's often a debate in Washington about which one is the most important. Uh, I think right now, US-China is probably the most important. And as everybody listening knows, it goes way beyond economics. 
but I'm, I'm a trade person, so I'm gonna focus primarily on, on trade and economic issues, but I'll try to put it in the larger context that, that we all operate in. Um, and like I suspect a lot of you, my views have evolved over the years, uh, beginning with pessimism when I started studying China, which was uh, to show my age during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, then uh, I moved to optimism in the 80s and 90s that, that the relationship might become a positive one despite our different approaches to governance and different world views. Uh, and then lately I've reverted back to pessimism uh, as the two countries have drifted into competition and, and confrontation, uh, both in economics and, and in, in security. Uh, I put most of the blame for that on China, frankly, uh, but there are clearly are people in both countries that are pulling us apart. Uh, and I'm skeptical of that will change in the short run, if that's, if that's sort of the bottom line of what I'm saying. Uh, I think recent history is one of evolution of perceptions of China from potential partner to existential threat. Uh, there was broad support. I was in the Clinton administration. This was not exactly my portfolio. Uh, my portfolio was export controls. We referred to my bureau as, as the speed bump on the information highway, but it did involve me with uh, China frequently because they were one of the people that we were trying to block technology going to even in the 90s. But at the time, uh, certainly in the administration, I think in the broader policy community, there was a lot of support uh, for China's uh, admission to the uh, accession to the WTO. I think there were no doubt some people who believed that economic liberalization would inevitably be followed with political liberalization. But I think decision makers in the administration were more motivated by the economic advantages of integrating China uh, into the rules-based international trading system, and not to mention the potential commercial gains for US companies uh, if we were able to do so. Uh, I've never been a big fan of the, uh, the Bob Lighthizer school of this was a big error in judgment, letting them into the WTO, which also begins with the hubris of suggesting it really was up to us whether they got in or not. It was a more complicated decision than that. I think the optimism at the time was credible uh, in light of comments then by Jean Zemin and Zhu Ranji, uh, indicating their desire to integrate China into the global system and to use their WTO obligations to persuade recalcitrant ministries to adopt reforms that Zhu was pushing anyway. Um, it didn't turn out that way, as we know, uh, partly because they left the scene, I think, and largely because their successors have pursued more state-centered economic policies, uh, culminating in, in uh, Xi Jinping, essentially taking the country, I think, backward economically to a more state-centric system. Um, when I was on the commission, one of my <coughs> The China Commission, one of my colleagues told me only partly in jest, and I think he's right, there are really only two kinds of companies in China, those that are owned by the government uh, and those that shut up and do what the government tells them. Uh, and we really see that in increasingly now as she has pursued a policy of, of exerting more government control uh, over, uh, over companies, even those where the government does not have a direct economic stake. Um, China's failure to meet our WTO accession expectations uh, in terms of transition to a more free market economy um, did have consequences, however, and I do want to uh, uh, call up a couple slides and hope that uh, we can make these work. Um, there we go. So um, the consequences, and not all due to just to uh, trade with China, but look, is, uh, we're an enormous uh, increase in our uh, ballooning of our bilateral trade deficit, uh, a loss of jobs in manufacturing, uh, which was true for a lot of reasons, but certainly was uh, exacerbated by Chinese trade. Uh, and until the last couple of years, stagnation uh, in household income. Uh, these are not incontrovertible statements. Um, and we can have an argument about it later on if you want. Some would argue that China's failure to meet its obligations uh, was due to loopholes our negotiators left, uh, that the rise in Chinese imports would have happened anyway, uh, and that job losses and income stagnation were due to other factors, uh, primarily technology advances. Uh, and I think you know there's something to be said for all those articles. Uh, David Autor, I'm sure many of you have read, and his co-authors, as I recall, have also suggested that the wave of job loss that, that uh, he reported on has largely passed through the economy uh, and is not likely to be repeated. So in that sense, maybe this is a one-off event. Uh, you never know. Um, 
But regardless, the damage has been done in terms of American public opinion uh, and in terms of congressional opinion, a damage that has been exacerbated by other Chinese actions increasingly perceived in the US as hostile. The South China Sea, Hong Kong, uh, actions toward Taiwan, what's going on in Xinjiang province, uh, what they've done to uh, journalists uh, and academics actually in China and, and so on. Uh, this chart, I went with this chart because it is late, it's the latest one. It's got data from last year, uh, <clears throat> but uh, in a way, the more telling chart is the one that has a 10 year or 11, well now 11 year span that goes back to 2011. Uh, because what that chart shows is that in 2011, opinions of China were 53% favorable. And if you look at this chart, uh, you can see an enormous change uh, in relatively 10 years, uh, particularly on, on, on the right side of, you know, 79% uh, of uh, Republicans, 67% of people in total now see, uh, feel, as they put it, cold toward China. There's other data that suggests they, that same percentage uh, roughly sees China as a, as a threat right now. That's an extraordinary change in a relatively short period of time. Um, and it's had a big impact on uh, the policymaking process uh, in Washington. Uh, the result really is that we kind of have a new adversary, uh, maybe not so new, but we have a new adversary. Um, Americans usually are happy to have someone to hate, um, look at the Cold War, and our politicians are happy to exploit that. Uh, for nearly 50 years, our primary adversary was the Soviet Union, uh, and China was a distant second, if that. As the Soviet Union faded into history and China began to open up economically after 1978, uh, threat perceptions began to change and the number of policy influencers who perceived China as an existential threat uh, began to grow. Uh, one of the more telling meetings I had uh, when I was uh, running the Trade Association was in the George W. Bush administration. <laughs> I went to visit uh, someone in, uh, at the national, on the National Security Council um, who had been on the Hill. I knew him from before. Uh, and I had actually gone to see him about something different. Uh, but at one point he sort of turns to me and out of the blue says, you know, there are millions of Chinese who wake up every morning thinking about how to kill Americans. And I, my immediate reaction was, well, you know, there's people at the Pentagon who think, wake up every morning thinking the same thing about the Chinese, that's their job. And not missing a step, he looks at me and says, not nearly enough. And what I've learned from that and other conversations is that people with that view have long existed in, the exec in both parties, in both the executive and legislative branches of government, in the media um, and in academia. Uh, and I've often concluded that from a policymaking standpoint, the best policy that governments can pursue is simply to make sure that those people don't end up in charge. Um, and sometimes they do. The individual who told me that story, or who told me that had, I had that conversation with, actually ended up in a much more senior position uh, in the Trump administration um, until like many others, he was fired. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I think probably if the best we can do is make sure that people, that, that people who don't think that China is an existential threat don't end up being in charge, maybe we've accomplished something. Um, I think the negative views that I'm talking about have accelerated um, uh, after Xi Jinping took all over and he's pursued what Elizabeth Economy called in her most recent book, more aggressive soft power, hard power, and sharp power. Uh, and if you want to know what those are, uh, we can get into that or you can buy her book. Um, uh, the situation further deteriorated uh, during the Trump administration as the president focused primarily on the bilateral deficit uh, and used his traditional bullying tactics to force China to change its trade and economic policies. That largely failed, but it left the Biden administration with a pothole strewn landscape, a phase one agreement that fell short of fulfillment, a phase two negotiation that never began, the tariffs and the retaliatory tariffs hanging over both economies, a range of aggressive Chinese actions in other areas, and a growing expression of Chinese uh, triumphalism, arguing to the rest of the world that democracy is an inferior political system, that their approach works better than ours. 
uh, as well as expanding Chinese investment and physical presence around the world that actually put meat on, on those bones. So that takes us to where we are now. And the Biden administration essentially has spent a year trying to figure out what to do about all that. Uh, when the president took office, I was asked frequently, what was the difference between the Biden China policy and the Trump China policy? And my response uh, for the first year was the same diagnosis, different prescription. Uh, the problems identified in Trump's uh, Section 301 report on China, massive subsidies, forced technology transfer, IP theft, discrimination against foreign companies in China are the same ones that the Biden administration perceives. And if there ever is a serious negotiation, Biden's economic demands will be the same as Trump's, same diagnosis. But there's more to the Biden economic policy than there was to Trump's. Uh, and I wanna talk about that a little bit. The metaphor that I've always uh, tended to use in, in uh, the bilateral relationship is the, meta the metaphor of the marathon. If you're running a marathon, uh, there are only two ways to win, uh, run faster than the other guy or trip the other guy. Um, in actual marathons, tripping the other guy is not really a legitimate strategy. Uh, but in international politics, international economics, it's entirely a legitimate strategy. Uh, but there are, the point is, there are two strategies. You have to run faster, uh, and tripping the other guy is not, at the end of the day, going to be sufficient. Uh, the administration, meaning the Biden administration, I think it's been a good, uh, spent a good bit of time developing the runner running faster part. You see it in the CHIPS Act, and you see it in other innovation supporting measures that are included in the Senate passed China bill, USICA, and which are also included in the House passed Compete Act, uh, which they are starting to debate today, uh, which will probably pass the House. And then the bill will be substantially changed in conference for reasons we can also talk about if you want to get into the weeds. But uh, the point is, you know, running faster has been on track. And in part, uh, it's not as controversial as it used to be. Uh, at least in this case, uh, because the Republicans are, are not all of them, but some of them have demonstrated, frankly, that uh, they'll buy anything if you link it to national security, which is what has happened in this case. Republicans historically have been skeptical to government interference in the, in, in the marketplace, uh, with good reason, I might add. One of the things I've learned, having been in the government interfering in the marketplace, um, is that when you do that, you create uh, unexpected collateral damage. Uh, which you are rarely well prepared for. But uh, what has happened uh, as we've conflated security issues with economic issues, which I'll get to in a bit, um, is Republicans have come to realize that if you sell uh, an industrial policy as combating uh, Chinese aggression, uh, they buy it. And so I think that uh, you know a, a, a large bill in some form either you seek a nor a compete, but something that is a combination of the two or uh, you know, a revised version of the two is going to make it. Uh, the harder part uh, is, is the tripping the other guy part. And what do you do if that's part of, your, part of your goal, even when you recognize the potential futility of that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't make the effort. And I think there, the first thing to remember is that the president has very little maneuvering room on China. There are already four to five Republican senators running against him in 2024. They have to push Trump off the stage first, which is a different question, but they all have the same platform on China. They're accusing Democrats in general and Biden in particular with being soft on China uh, and undermining our security and our economic competitiveness by his lack of strong action. And they're competing with each other to see who can develop the toughest anti-China proposals. You know, this is not a political environment in Washington right now that leads to reasoned debate uh, over China policy. Congressional Democrats, not wanting to be caught short in this debate, have adopted a similar hard line to China, minus the personal criticism of Biden. You know, listen to Chuck Schumer and listen to Marco Rubio, and there's not a lot of difference uh, when it comes to China except in which one is willing to criticize Biden directly. Much of the business community, in addition, has publicly retreated from this debate 
and with some exceptions, has stopped talking about the importance of working cooperatively with China. The result has been a significant rightward shift in the public debate on China. And essentially what's happened is the conversation has largely been ceded uh, to the anti-China security hawks. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but, uh, and I'll have more to say about the business community uh, later on, but uh, the people that were all talking 10 years ago about constructive engagement, uh, they've stopped talking about that. That's not to say they don't believe it, uh, but the debate has changed, the public debate has changed, and it's all about uh, the latest Chinese uh, evil deed, whatever it happened to be, and US efforts to, uh, to counter it. As a result, I think both China and the US seem to have concluded that they've got little to gain from a serious negotiation right now. The Chinese know that the US, if there were one, would only demand the same things that they refused to give Trump and which they will continue to refuse to give the United States. That I have to say, I think is more a political than an economic decision. What the United States wants China to do in economics, I think is actually good for them and would be growth promoting for them. Uh, I think the Chinese view is that uh, it's a political view. It will uh, undermine the party's control uh, and they're probably right about that. Uh, so they've made a political judgment and they're making, I think a, an economic sacrifice in doing so, but uh, that's not going to change. Uh, they're not, and they're not going to be very excited about another negotiation like the one they had with Trump where they have to go through all this again. Likewise, uh, Biden, I think, knows that any agreement he reaches will inevitably be attacked by the Republicans as inadequate uh, and compromising our security. The result is for him that the easiest and safest course of action, actually not for both sides, is to do nothing serious right now uh, while at the same time leaving the impression that they are nevertheless working on it. And that latter point's important because at the same time Biden's being criticized for being soft on China, he's also being criticized for not having a policy. And that's not a good position to be in uh, when you're the president. Um, Ambassador Tai's speech at CSIS in October uh, was a response to that. And it was an attempt to resolve, I think, the fundamental dilemma that they continue to wrestle with, which is, why have a negotiation if you believe that no satisfactory outcome is possible? And if you believe that, uh, what do you do in lieu of a negotiation, at least to make it look like you're doing something? Uh, the administration appears divided on that. Uh, Bob Davis, uh, late of the Wall Street Journal, has a very thoughtful piece in Politico that came out uh, on Monday, which I commend to your attention if you haven't already seen it, that <clears throat> explains in considerable, it's sort of an inside baseball piece that explains the divisions on trade policy generally. Um, and on China, I have a little more uh, simpler view than, than he does. Uh, I believe there's simply a, a dichotomy inside the administration between those who believe there's really no point in negotiations and that we should just get on with deciding what we want to do um, and uh, others that want to continue talking. Uh, and they want to continue talking because, one, they believe there's still low-hanging fruit that could be picked. Two, even if there isn't low-hanging fruit to be picked, they need to construct a narrative uh, that will justify uh, further retaliatory actions. And failed negotiations is a good way to construct that narrative. So before you get to that point of acting, you need to build the case, as it were. And uh, not succeeding in talks is one way to do that. Uh, and finally, frankly, I think they don't know what else to do uh, and have concluded that uh, you know, the right thing to do is kick the can until you figure out what to do. So there's a lot of postponement going on without actually saying so. The solution that they come out with, which is what Catherine announced in October, was to continue talks with China that will focus on China's failure to meet its phase one commitments. Uh, that's a safe choice. No one's going to criticize that. Uh, they made commitments and they failed to meet them, uh, both with respect to purchases, but also with respect to uh, some of the regulatory changes that they promised to make. <laughs> Frankly, if you talk to the business community about this, and I, I have, they'll tell you that China has actually met quite a number of, of the obligations they undertook, but they've not met all of them. Um, Agriculture Secretary Vil Vilsack gave a speech um, about the same time that Ambassador Tai gave hers, where he said that in agriculture, the Chinese had met 50 of the 57 obligations they had undertaken. 
he didn't detail the other seven. Um, I think some of them are related to uh, GMOs, uh, uh, among others. But uh, uh, as of, I think, last month, he was still talking about the, the seven remaining items. So there are other, there's, they have not met their commitments and going after them is, is fair game. Uh, the problem with that is that you can't do that indefinitely. And at some point the government has to move on. 2021 is in the history books now and continuing to focus on what didn't happen last year um, it has a limited half-life. And so they're going to have to come up with something new. And I think they're gonna to have to come up with it relatively soon. So that gets us to the, the question of, so what does that mean? What do we do? <laughs> what might we do? And of course, there's always the possibility of having talks that actually accomplish something. Um, I think that's the least likely option, certainly as long as Xi Jinping is in charge. Um, the Chinese are not willing to give, what, give us what we want. And anything short of their capitulation will be criticized here as tantamount to our own surrender. Uh, so there's a search for uh, next steps. Uh, if only for domestic political reasons, to provide a basis for refuting Republican criticism. And of course, there's a number of tools in the, in the proverbial toolbox that the administration uh, is looking at. And let me uh, talk about several of them. <laughs> the first one is uh, import actions, uh, which means tariffs for the most part. <laughs> import actions are intended to inflict economic harm on the adversary. The primary tool is continuation of the existing tariffs in current or modified form. There seems to be agreement amongst economists uh, that the tariffs have not addressed the problems they were intended to address and that their cost to both China and the United States exceeds their benefit. So getting rid of them uh, would make economic sense. That would not, uh, however, make political sense unless China is prepared to make major concessions on phase two issues which as I've said, they clearly are not. At this point, I think the most likely import related move is to maintain or actually increase tariffs selectively on items that are benefiting from Chinese subsidies or benefiting from the unfair trade practices that we've identified, but also eliminating other tariffs that are not in that category. Uh, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, slices the bologna fairly slim, uh, fairly, fairly thin to be honest about it but it does have the benefit of reducing the economic harm that's being done here and there. Uh, and at the same time, it mitigates the inevitable criticism because it really only affects tariffs in areas that don't have uh, competitiveness or security implications. The other part, which is going to be, I think, more in focus is uh, the security uh, angle. As I said, one of the things that, ha that has happened is security has become uh, conflated with economics in the Chinese case. And this is a little bit new for us. You know, when we were fighting the Cold War, we had an adversary that was a significant security threat that was never an economic threat. Um, and those of you that are, that are uh, my age and, and Bill Overholt's age recall the, the challenges we faced with Japan, particularly in the 80s. But Japan was an economic threat. It was never a security threat. It was an ally. With China, we have both. Uh, we have both an economic and a security challenge. And that's changed the nature of the debate because uh, the actions that uh, the Chinese are taking are taking not only have economic consequences, and you can debate the extent of that, and you can debate the relevance of the trade deficit and on and on and on, uh, but they also have security uh, consequences in terms of the China, enabling the Chinese to uh, build up a much larger defense apparatus and ability to do things that particularly in the cyber area that might ultimately, uh, and in the ICT sectors, information communication technology that compromises our abilities, including our war capabilities. Uh, so the, the issue now is not just job and manufacturing loss. It's also Chinese acquisition of US technology that gives them uh, advantages that we would prefer they not have. Um, and this is something that, you know, this is, this is my portfolio in the Clinton administration. It's something I've spent a lot of time working on. And the main tool in this area historically has been export controls. Uh, in the US, those dates to 1949, uh, globally, they actually go back to at least the 13th century. 
Um, I could do 20 minutes on longbow technology and uh, how the British uh, kept it away from the French and what the French did about it. It's kind of a metaphor for the 21st century, but I won't bore you with that. Um, the most important point is that in the current context is that US ex export control law has always been extraterritorial. That is, it's applied not only to exports directly from the United States, but also to exports from other parties uh, to uh, third country destinations. But uh, the Trump administration expanded its extraterritoriality via what's called the foreign direct product rule, uh, which went beyond what the United States has done historically, which was to control foreign exports that had US content in them. And the foreign direct product rule expands that also to control foreign items if they were made with US equipment, semiconductors being the obvious example. They apply to the limited way, basically semiconductors to Huawei, but it opened a door, uh, a rather significant door uh, in which the United States claimed jurisdiction over items, not simply because they contained US content, which we had always claimed, but because they were made with US uh, manufacturing equipment or US or designed with US software. Uh, you may see this issue coming up uh, very shortly, uh, depending upon Russia does, what Russia does in Ukraine, because it's very much on the table as a potential sanction uh, to be used against Russia should they invade. Um, the most likely next move, I think, with respect to China is not to further expand the rules, because the rules are already fairly elastic, uh, but to apply them more broadly uh, beyond Huawei uh, to more Chinese companies and to put more country, com Chinese companies on the several sort of bad guy lists that the US government uh, maintains, each of which has different uh, consequences. I should say that this is a double-edged uh, sword <coughs> and always has been. Um, administering export controls has always involved walking a fine line between under controlling, which means your adversaries are gonna get things that you don't want them to have, uh, and over controlling, uh, which has the downside of depriving critical domestic industries from revenue they need to develop uh, next generation products. Um, and here I'll digress for a second <clears throat> uh, to talk about the, the history of this because it's, it's gonna be debated actually today, probably in, in the house. Uh, the, uh, there was a sea change in thinking about export controls in the Clinton administration. And I'd like to take credit for it, but we really it was led by Bill Perry, who was initially the undersecretary and then later the secretary of defense, who realized uh, that the nature of warfare was changing um, at one point, one of his, uh, one of his uh, assistants told me only partly in jest that one of their procurement problems was uh, the, the procurement process for the stuff they were buying took longer than the, life, uh, than the lifespan of what they were buying. And he was talking about software, but Perry realized that if you, if you focused entirely on stuff that was specially designed for the military, uh, the process of getting that designed, agreed upon amongst the various services, and then acquired was so long that it was virtually certain to be out of date by the time it arrived. Uh, and that particularly for information communication technology, and if you think warfare really be driven by chips the same way that the rest of us are driven by chips, you can see why it's important. The answer was go to commercial off the shelf. But if you do that, that forces you to rethink the entire export control structure. Because if you do that, you realize that the Pentagon now is becoming a customer of IBM, Intel, Cisco, Micron, you name it. But it's never going to be a very big customer for those com companies. It's always going to be a very small direct customer. Um, and therefore, the companies are not going to change their business practices or their, their business models simply to suit a relatively small client. So the question for the Pentagon became, what do we really want? And the answer was, we want these companies in the United States to be healthy and profitable, because if they're healthy and profitable, they will be investing in new technology and they'll make next generation stuff that will provide opportunities for us to continually upgrade uh, our weapon systems. 
And so the next question that Perry wrestled with was how do we make them healthy and profitable? And if you look at their business models and you look at their revenue uh, streams, you saw that the way to make them healthy and profitable was to let them export because that's where more than half their revenue was coming from at the, even at that time. So once you reach that point in your thinking, you've turned the export control equation on its head and you realize that if you want to have profitable US companies engaged in cutting edge, te cutting edge technology, cutting edge technology, which they are supplying to the military sector, you need those companies to be profitable, which means you have to let them export. So over controlling, which is what's being debated now in the administration, uh, has the effect, of course, of denying more stuff to China in this case. It also has the effect of kneecapping your own industries. And the long-term outcome of that for our own military establishment is not a positive one. Skirmishes on that have already broken out in the Congress. The administration is wrestling with it and it remains to be seen how it's gonna turn out. A related security tool, uh, which has come to the fore also recently is controlling investment. Uh, inbound investment is controlled by a process that dates back at least to the 80s. Actually, it dates back to the Ford administration if you wanna be uh, uh, weedy about it. Um, it's worked pretty well. It was upgraded in 2018. Uh, recently, I think the task has been made a little easier with respect to China because of a significant decline in Chinese direct you know, FDI, uh, Chinese investment in the United States, uh, in large part due to Chinese efforts to discourage that, except in selected targeted areas, which happen to be the target areas that we are most inclined to shut off. Uh, but uh, I don't see significant statutory changes. Uh, in that process because they were made more recent only, they were only made in late 2018. Um, so if there's going to be policy changes, they'll be reflected in the way the statute is administered. The new thing, uh, which is debated, being debated today because it's in the House China bill, it's not in the Senate bill, um, is a similar review process for outbound investment. That is telling companies that if they want to make, engage in certain transactions, and the word is used advisedly, transactions, not just investment. So it's a broader term, but it certainly includes investment. Uh, that, uh, and they want to make those outbound investments uh, into selected countries, and China would be one of them. Uh, that also needs to be reviewed by the government. Uh, that proposal was considered in 2018 and was abandoned, largely because it was reviewed as redundant uh, with export controls and unnecessary, but it's back. It has some very persistent advocates. Uh, its fate is uncertain at this point. It'll be bitterly imposed by the, uh, opposed by the business community. Um, but uh, uh, we'll see what, what happens. The administration thus far has not endorsed it. Uh, they've endorsed other parts of the bill explicitly, but they didn't mention this one. Um, so we'll see what happens. If it does happen, it would be a major expansion of government involvement uh, in the investment process and would be a significant change of a very long-standing U.S. policy. Um, going back to, you know, both strategies, run faster and tripping, uh, an integral part in the Biden administration is a multilateral approach, uh, which may actually be the biggest difference between Biden and Trump. Trump was a confirmed unilateralist. He was not interested in cooperating with uh, with uh, partners. In fact, he took, took great delight in irritating them. Uh, Biden is a built-in multilateralist on virtually everything. You can fault execution on that, and, and I can if you want to get into it, but uh, clearly he believes in, in a cooperative approach, and he's attempting to build a coalition of like-minded countries that are also willing to confront China on its unfair trade practices, and he's begun finally also to develop an economic strategy for the US and Asia, which has been long awaited. Um, operationalizing the concept of cooperation, which is a fairly elastic term uh, in both uh, cases is going to be a challenge. The US joined uh, the EU in its proposed trade and technology council, uh, which may or may not end up being about China. It sort of is. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the Europeans don't always want to talk about it quite that way. Uh, Europe really has to sort out what it means 
by a term that it invented, strategic autonomy. And every European I've talked to has a different definition of the term, uh, which ranges from trying to build up our own ICT sector, which is lacking in Europe, to we want to be a third force somewhere in between the US and China. The US view, of course, is we want you on our team. We don't want an independent third force. That all needs to be sorted out. And I think strategic cooperation is going to be limited in, in, until it is. Um, if you want to see the, the complexity and difficulty of that process, just watch the new German government uh, as they try to figure out what they think about China and what they want to do about it. Um, on, similarly, with respect to Asia, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is, has been launched, uh, it comes with uh, few, if any, visible tangible benefits. Market access is not on the table. Uh, and by saying the, they don't intend to submit it to Congress for approval, the administration is really telling Asians that it does not intend to make any significant concessions. That will make it difficult for countries to take the risk of offending their largest neighbor without any tangible benefits in, the, in sight. I think what that ultimately leads to is probably the weak coalition of the usual suspects, countries that already agree with most of what we want to accomplish, which isn't going to advance the ball in Asia very far. Commercial here, uh, Matt Goodman and I at CSIS just put out a paper last week precisely on this issue. Uh, detailing what we think the administration ought to do to make this the kind of success that they want it to be. And you can find that on the website if you are interested in the IPEF um, or want to go into greater detail about it. Finally, let me close with some comments about the role of the business community, which takes me back to the title of the talk. When I ran the National Foreign Trade Council, uh, which was 2001 th uh, through um, 2000. 15, middle of 2016, uh, I represented large multinational companies. And what I learned about them was that they were all in China, they were all profitable, and they were all unhappy. Uh, and their dilemma then and now is that China is simultaneously their best customer and their biggest threat. They need the market, but they see the train coming down the track towards them. The enormous size of the Chinese market has been an irresistible attraction for US companies. However, as China has moved up the value added chain and as US security driven pressures to counter them have grown, the Chinese have become more selective about who is welcome in China, more creative in limiting the reach of foreign companies in China, and more determined to go it alone in developing critical technologies, which you can see in the ICT sector in particular. Chinese intentions I think are clear, read their five-year plans, uh, the last one and the incoming one, it's to develop global champions in a range of critical technologies and to establish global leadership through means both legal uh, and illegal. They don't put it that way, but if you listen, uh, if you watch NBC News and listen to the, the uh, interview that was done, Lester Holt did last night with the director of the FBI, one of the comments he did is they, they he said roughly on average, every 12 hours, they over open a new investigation into Chinese espionage and Chinese uh, cyber espionage. There are now over 2,000 pending investigations. Um, that tells you what our government is focused on. Um, and so what's clear, I think, if you look at Chinese plans is that we are the leader in many of the technologies where they intend to become the leader. So their ambitions come at our expense, which means we need to take their ambitions very seriously. So what we've got now is a situation where the government focuses on China as a threat. Business is still focusing on China as the best customer. Uh, and that's a policy dilemma. Uh, the, business, the business dilemma is whether to potentially sacrifice long-term competitiveness in the interest of obtaining short-term profits. Wall Street's emphasis on quarterly earnings and share price push companies in the direction of the latter even if it's not in their long-term interest. This leads, this division between business and government, I think, leads us in, in, in two directions. First, as the US government pursues tighter tech transfer policies, and they will, uh, and, if we, and if we continue the tariffs in some form, we might, uh, we're going to see more decoupling 
uh, as US companies reassess the political risk of doing business in China. Uh, this is sand leaking out of the bag. This is not one cataclysmic event. The breadth and pace of it will depend on individual companies' business models and the extent of their existing investment in, in China. But I think the trend is likely. While both governments deny it, in effect, both governments are forcing companies to choose between them. Um, and you can, there's no better example than you can see how companies are struggling in trying to handle the forced labor issue. Because you've got companies, particularly in the apparel sector, discovering that they're criticized in the West if they use Xinjiang cotton, and they're criticized in China if they don't. Uh, and there are people in both, their, both parts of the world that troll their websites, troll their, their uh, product, uh, procurement patterns, and call them out if they're doing one or the other. And this puts companies in the, comp in the position they hate. No matter what they do, somebody's going to say they're wrong. Um, and that puts them in a very awkward position. And it vastly increases, I think, the risk of doing business in China. I think the other thing that's happening is that we are all gradually realizing that the real arena of competition, uh, economic competition between our two countries lies in third markets. Uh, China is not going to treat foreigners fairly in China. Uh, and we can do the same thing to them here if we want to. It's competing with them in the rest of the world that matters because that's where uh, their goals uh, their uh, global leadership goals are going to come to fruition uh, or not. Uh, that's why running faster is ultimately the better policy and why it needs to include more effective use of American soft power to counter Chinese efforts like the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and also uh, it, it's incumbent on us to make a sustained effort to prevent Chinese takeover of international institutions, particularly institutions that set international standards. And you can see a, a relatively coherent Chinese effort to do precisely that. Uh, not always successful, but uh, the effort is there nonetheless. So as I said in the beginning, um, I started out as a pessimist. I became an optimist in the 80s and 90s, but I've reverted to pessimism in recent years. Uh, I think uh, Xi Jinping appears to view the US as a declining power. I think that's a mistake, uh, but um, I, I am worried that in the United States, we do have this tendency sometimes to believe, you know, we're the good guys. And, and because of that, uh, and because we're exceptional, uh, that's going to pull us through and allow us to prevail. I think the biggest danger is that uh, both sides underestimate the other. Uh, and I'm very worried about that. For the time being, I think the best we can hope for in the economic sphere is responsible management of our differences while both sides undertake to strengthen their competitive positions. That latter part is not a bad thing. Competition is healthy. It'd be nice if competition were fair. And that's why the tripping the other guy strategy is, is not irrelevant. If people are cheating, it's important to call them out and it's important to try to do something about it. But that can't be the only strategy because in the end, it by itself is not going to be the successful one. Running faster can be the successful one if Congress is willing to support it. We'll see over the next few weeks, uh, trying to block China's rise, which we constantly say we're not trying to do, but in fact we are, uh, can be an important co corollary to that strategy. But as I said, we should not be under the illusion that that by itself will be sufficient. So with that, uh, let me stop, Bill, and turn it back to you. And Mark, if you can take down the slides, you'll save me the trouble of figuring out how to do that. Perfect. You're on mute, Bill. Uh, thanks so much, Bill. That was uh, so insightful, uh, both as to the issues and and as to the the uh, game in in Washington. Um, let me start off by asking. Uh, couple questions, but, but then spelling out a premise. And the, the, the question is, are we structurally incapable of going back to international economic trade leadership and addressing our domestic social problem? Uh, and let me, 
specify what's been a theme song of mine for some years. Uh, our, our big domestic social issue is that we and other countries, including China, are going through a great transition from an, an era of manufacturing jobs to an era of service jobs. Uh, it's very much like the transition uh, we did over a century ago from being almost all agricultural jobs to mostly manufacturing jobs. Everybody but Willie Nelson has given up on, <laughs> on get, get, getting back the uh, agricultural jobs. But uh, we're in a situation in Washington where the Democrats are uh, very dependent on the manufacturing unions, uh, which don't allow you to talk about transitioning from manufacturing jobs to service jobs. You're only allowed to uh, take the Willie Nelson position. We're going to get the manufacturing jobs back. Uh, and uh, the Republic, if, if you say we're going to help people the way the Chinese have done, they, they, they transitioned 50 million people from manufacturing jobs to services jobs while we were whining about 3 million. Uh, uh, that you, you, to do something about it, you have to empower the government, and fund the government, and the Republicans are never going to agree to that. So are we, are we structurally stuck for the indefinite future in a situation where we cannot go back to uh, global economic leadership, uh, we can't we can't promote the running faster choice that that you suggested, and and we worsen our domestic social problem of of people stuck in manufacturing jobs that are that are going away. Well, it would have been nice to start with a softball. Uh... <laughs> and, and that is not um, a couple things. First of all, what has interested me lately and I, I, is to uh, add a footnote to your data. I think you're certainly right about uh, the U.S. economy and actually most Western economies. But there is some uh, hint, in, including in some Chinese statements recently, that they have, are charting a different path, which is uh, not to transition to services, but to focus on advanced manufacturing. Um, I don't know how that will work out for them. It, it, nobody else has done that. Uh, most people have undertaken uh, either deliberately or just because of the way the market works, exactly the transition to services that you're describing. Um, the Chinese are sending signals that they don't intend to do that, um, which is kind of a gamble and we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, as far as the United States is concerned, I wouldn't say we can't resume leadership. Uh, I will say uh, we may not. Uh, and, and the path that we're on right now doesn't get us back there. Uh, and we have become, uh, I think, uh, very internally focused on, on how to construct a trade policy. Uh, the administration is couching it in, in global terms uh, and is trying to say what we want to do really to, to, is to reassert global leadership and to do it in a way that creates a, a, a trade policy that we hope other countries will follow that is uh, benefits workers uh, and is you know, fair uh, to uh, workers and takes into account uh, the environment and uh, gender disparities and a whole bunch of disparities and a whole bunch of other things that, that uh, particularly the left wing of the Democratic Party believes have gotten uh, short shrift in, previous trade policies. Um, I think the president's dilemma has been that it's very easy to say that's what you want to do. It's been very hard for them to actually come up with a program for doing that uh, and trying to figure out uh, exactly what that means uh, internationally. And you can see in the Indo-Pacific economic framework how they've made their job more difficult because they've taken off the table things that might grease the wheels, if you will. If you're gonna say, 
we're not going to deal with market access. Uh, basically, you're telling the Asian countries there's nothing in it for them. Uh, and so why they would want to get involved unless you're all they're all unless you're Australia or Japan and or want to, you know, support the same kind of regulatory regime that we're advocating because you've already got that. Um, I mean, I, I, they're kind of tying a hand behind the, the administration, kind of tying a hand behind its back. Um, when they talk about, you know, a, a new kind of trade policy, um, also uh, they don't they don't talk about it in conventional terms. And and you're right when they talk about a trade policy uh, for workers, what that appears to mean is one emphasizing enforcement of labor standards. If you look at the U.S. Canada Mexico agreement, you can see what they mean. And actually, that seems to be working pretty well. It's not. It's not either. It's it's a good idea, um, and you know whether they can uh, spread that out and, and generalize it beyond a, a single trilateral agreement. I don't know. Uh, they also seem to be interested in how do we redistribute the benefits of trade away from corporate executives and toward the workers. Um, and my argument with them about that has been you're confusing creation of benefits with distribution of benefits. Trade agreements create benefits. Uh, how they're distributed has more to do with what corporations do with the money and has to do with government tax policy, government adjustment policy, uh, and things like that. And they don't seem to be quite focused on that. Um, and frankly, also, uh, sadly, there, the third element of a trade policy for workers uh, for the United States is reshoring uh, and trying to bring manufacturing jobs back here. So their answer, I think, to your point is, you know, it's not, uh, not far from getting stuck within the manufacturing sector. We actually want to revitalize it uh, and, and bring it back here and create more good jobs. Uh, that kind of sells short the services sector, which, you know, has a lot of good jobs. I mean, people equate, you know, people uh, say, ah, services, that means people working at McDonald's. Well, yeah, they're service workers. Um, you know, so are doctors, uh, so, are, so are EMTs, so are architects, so are lawyers, so are uh, nurse practitioners, uh, you know, so, uh, so are software designers. I mean, there's a whole range of services out there in the economy that are uh, require a lot of training and are very well paying. And uh, I wouldn't want anybody to think that a services economy means that we are simply heading toward a, a uh, um, you know, a, an entire generation of people who, uh, who are waiters and waitresses. Rambling answer best I can do. I, I couldn't agree more. Um... I, I just comment on the advanced manufacturing that I think that like us, they're moving, the Chinese are moving into advanced manufacturing, but the, they're not moving in, they're not moving back to manufacturing jobs. They're moving to robots faster than we are. Um, well, that may, that may be how they do it. You're right. That's a good point. Um, a, a, a broader question. Uh, there are a number of scholars who've made the point that uh, we're not just fighting over specific industries and specific jobs, but what we may be seeing in the U.S., they think, is a broad loss of a manufacturing sector. You don't see that in the total output figures, but a loss of a set of skills and, and uh, manufacturing ex experiences and basic equipment that just leads us to, to be weak uh, across many, many areas of manufacturing. And, do you know if anybody is is asking the question if that's a concern uh, how do we how do we think about what we need to preserve 
uh, how do we define what's necessary and, and what's not? This is the uh, this is the hu a huge question. And I've read, written and talked about this because in the end, it's going to come down to, as far as the administration is concerned, any administration, what is your definition of, of security? What is your definition of what you have to have? Because if you don't define it, you end up talking about autarky. You know, we need to make everything ourselves, uh, which is both stupid and, and impossible. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, reasonable people disagree. But if you're Peter Navarro, you know, the answer is everything or almost everything. Um, and it can go to ridiculous <laughs> extremes. One of my the more amusing episodes I had was I don't know, five or six years ago when, when Schwanle uh, bought Smithfield, the, uh, the very large Virginia ham and pork producer. And you had United States senators arguing that that should be blocked, that acquisition should be blocked on national security grounds. Uh, the essence of that argument was that bacon was a national security item. And uh, that was not a prevailing argument. Bacon didn't make the cut, but, as it were, but you have to, you know, it, it raises the question of what is and what isn't. And it's not clearly, the, the Biden administration has not drawn that line yet. They've drawn it partially because the, the president commissioned four supply chain studies that were published last June, critical materials, batteries, semiconductors, and pharmaceuticals slash PPE. Um, and uh, I don't think there was a lot of debate that those are critical sectors. Uh, what we learned via COVID is that, you know, we sometimes we run out of stuff that we don't want to run out of. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have the capacity to not run out of it. Uh, and, you know, supply chain managers are newly being told, in addition to price, quality, and delivery, you need to build resilience into your models. That's producing sea changes gradually in supply changes, supply chains that leads I was just on a conference call where we were talking about this, it leads to suboptimal outcomes because if you build resilience in, that means you're gonna to have to abandon least cost, maybe, uh, and you may have to abandon best quality. Uh, you don't wanna do either of those things. But if you want to not put all your eggs in a single basket, particularly not put all your eggs in a Chinese basket, uh, you're gonna to have to take all those things into account. Um, Doing it with those four sectors, I think, has not been controversial. And I think you're going to see companies that are in those sectors uh, changing their supply chains because they've, on their own, I think, realized that they need to uh, develop more diversified and more resilient supply chains. Uh, the issue will come if how far do we expand beyond those four? Uh, at the same time, the president ordered those four studies. He ordered six other ones that are much broader, transportation, energy, agriculture, defense industrial base, two others I've forgotten. Uh, together, they, they encompass 60% of our GDP. Those are due this month. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how far they go in suggesting that we need to have domestic capability uh, in all those very large sectors. Uh, it's hard for me to believe they'll do that, but if they do, then you're talking about an enormous change in the way our economy is structured and you're putting a huge burden on the administration to decide how we get there. You know, the answer in chips has been, let's spend a lot of money to support the development of fab facilities in the United States. And I think taxpayers will go along with that because they understand why semiconductors matter and why having a fab capability in the United States matters. If you start doing that for sector after sector after sector, I think people are gonna say, wait a minute, are we getting into bacon-like issues here? And you know, when do we say, you know, it would be nice if we could make that, but it's really okay if somebody else makes it and we just buy it. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have a question from Nara Dillon, who's also a member of the organizing committee. She says, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, why do you think US businesses have retreated from participating in our public debate about Sino-American relations. Do you think this trend is likely to continue? I do think it's likely to continue. Uh, I think 
it's, it, there's two reasons that I would say. One, I think uh, they gen uh, some of them genuinely don't know what to do. Um, I mean, they have the dilemma I described, best customer, biggest threat, and they don't know how to proceed. Uh, they don't want to give up the market. They don't want to give up profit, uh, but they see what's happening and they have not yet figured out a path through that. Uh, the clearest path uh, for a lot of them would be decoupling, but they don't want to do that because they don't want to lose the customer. And, and, and it's a lot of money. Um, even a small market share in China is a, uh, is a small amount of money. Um, I think the other reason, I mean, it's a large amount of money. Um, the other reason is if you engage in that debate, uh, then what happens inevitably uh, is that the China hawks accuse you of being, uh, of misunderstanding the Chinese threat, being soft on security and giving away our country's patrimony. Uh, that no matter what you make, uh, you know, if you're gonna, if you're going to do business with the Chinese, you're endangering, uh, your company's survivability, and by endangering your survivability, you're endangering all of our survivability. I mean, that's not a viable argument, but uh, that's what they face. I mean, I had a very telling conversation years ago when I was running the trade associations with one of, with one of my board members who was a, a senior executive in one of the companies that we're talking about. Uh, and I said to a group of them, including him, he said, you know, I said, you guys have got good stories. You're doing good things uh, in the social, environmental, you know, ESG sector. Why don't you tell your stories? Get out there. And the answer was, it was the, it was the proverb about the, the Japanese proverb about the nail that sticks up. I said, they said, if we tell our stories, two things will happen. Uh, the other side will, will say, oh yeah, they're doing that, but here's 12, 12 other things they're not doing that they should do. Uh, and other people will say, yeah, they're doing that, but it's really not as good as they say they are. Uh, and it has all this, these hidden elements to it that it's really bad. And they said, we just don't want to go through that. Uh, and uh, I think companies are risk averse in the public sphere. And they've decided it's not worth it to engage in this argument, particularly right now. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Lawrence, Lawrence Sullivan. Uh, why is U.S. business increasing investment in China? Well, I'm not sure how long that's going to last. In fact, I would I would say I don't have the recent numbers. I, I'm not I'm not sure they are, uh, but I would say that even if if they are on an absolute basis, uh, I would say the, the rate of increase uh, has declined, um, and you also have to look at at time periods. You know. Uh, if you're comparing 2021 to 2020, um, I can see why there would be an increase uh, that's uh, COVID related um, it, over the long term. Um, I, I think to the extent that's happening, it's because it's a very large market. People are entranced by the market. Uh, there are some sectors that uh, can uh, engage there uh, effect effectively. Uh, that don't raise any of the security questions that I'm talking about. If you make, um, look at Procter & Gamble, for example, you know, if you're selling shampoo or pampers or toothpaste, uh, markets are markets and bigger markets are attractive. And if you can make your product attractive in that country, you're gonna invest more and do it. And by and large companies like that are not gonna get caught up in the, in the policy dialogue that I'm describing. Um, if you're an ICT company right now, I'd be very surprised if you're investing in China. Uh, I mean, if you're already there in a big way, then you're committed and you may, you know, you may feel obligated to continue to do, continue what is already there. But uh, if I were advising those companies, I would say that's a mistake. Thank you. Uh, for viewers who are interested in subject of U.S. investment uh, in China, I would urge you to Google the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai and look at their annual survey. Uh, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite revealing. Um, uh, another question 
for you, Bill. Uh, the Wall Street Journal just reported that the Biden administration will scrutinize China-backed apps like TikTok and publish new policies. What is your prediction about how harsh their decisions will be? Yeah, that's a good question. They've kind of um, put that one on the back burner, partly because there was a, you know, Trump attempted to do that with, uh, with TikTok and and WeChat, and there was a court order uh, that that blocked him on that. And I think that uh, the Biden administration is, you know, has not fought that, but it it kind of leaves the kind of the, the question hanging about what they're going to do. Um, I don't have any blinding insights uh, on that. I think it's a hard. Uh, it's a hard problem. I mean, uh, frankly, uh, speaking personally, uh, if I were going to assess Chinese security threats uh, in the ICT sector, uh, TikTok and TikTok and, and WeChat would be pretty far down my list uh, of things. I think the uh, the argument is based on on uh, the flow of data that would be going to. TikTok users. I mean, uh, TikTok as a company claims that none of their data ends up in Chinese hands. Um, you can believe that or not. I don't have an opinion on that subject. That's what they say. And they are, they claim to be kind of a separate company, if you will, from ByteDance. Uh, again, you can believe that or not. Um, but uh, are we worried about that kind of data going to China? Number one, uh, as I said, not at the top of my list. Uh, the other uh, possible, the other argument has been the influencing potential uh, of the technology that it's going to, you know, all the 14 year olds who tune in are going to be ultimately recipients of Chinese propaganda of one sort or another and be influenced to take a different attitude toward China. Um, that's, I can't say that's not going to happen. Uh, it's not impossible. Um, I'd like to think our teenagers are smarter than that. Uh, but as again, I, I don't think that's the biggest problem we have with them. Uh, if you wanted to rank order our, our cyber problems and our data and access problems, I'd listen to the FBI director first. Uh, as to what they're gonna do, um, I don't know. I don't think this is gonna at the top of their list either uh, in terms of, of actions. I think they're much more focused on semiconductors uh, and, and trying to uh, slow Chinese product, progress at the high end there. I'm afraid uh, we've run out of time for questions. Uh, before we close, let me just mention that next week, uh, we will be having a special session organized by the Weatherhead Center on China's role in the world. Is China exporting authoritarianism? I think that's gonna be a, a very lively and important session. Uh, Bill, thank you so much. This was so informative and, and so insightful. Uh, on behalf of Director Michael Sony, uh, let me thank you tr tremendously. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. Happy to uh, be with you and uh, good luck with future lectures. Thank you. So Mark, I'm gonna get off, okay?